uh, welcome to Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's so good to have you here with the uh, Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. Thank you so much. It's actually really great to be here. I want to talk to you about, you know, your life, your heart, your passions. But before I do that, we, we have to really discuss uh, 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 what's just happened in the last number of days. Uh, um, Israel just declared six Palestinian uh, NGOs to be terrorist organizations. That's the word they used. Uh, following which there's been an outcry from activists like us uh, all around the world, uh, thank God. But uh, what would you expect when there was nary a peep, was it back in uh, uh, July when Israeli forces uh, raided the offices of uh, the De Defense for Children International in Ramallah? Uh, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International said, this appalling and unjust decision is an attack by the Israeli government on the international human rights movement. Give us your reactions to what's happened. Well, that's exactly right. And the unfortunate part of it is it's not the first time, uh, and it probably won't be the last, that Israel attacks human rights organizations. They have been doing it since as long as I've been involved in the issue from uh, raiding offices, ar arresting people that work at these organizations, arresting directors, stealing files, uh, and, and now they've gone and declared these organizations to be terrorist organizations, which is not just a label. This will authorize Israel, according to their own law, of not only raiding them, shutting them down, preventing or uh, them from getting funding, international institutions, uh, detaining their uh, workers for long periods of time and this comes after many years of Israel trying to get foreign organizations mainly from the EU and the United States to break off contact or to right. stop funding these organizations and the EU and US funders and and collaborative organizations have said that there is no basis on which uh, to cut off relations that they have found no truth to what Israel is saying, no evidence. Um, but Israel went ahead and, and, and did it anyway as a way for it to stop these, uh, these funds from coming in. And like you said, thank goodness there has been a big outcry. In fact, just, yes, just the other day, uh, 235 organizations came out with a very strong statement, including Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. Uh, the other day also we had a resolution introduced in Congress uh, condemning Israel's actions. Uh, and, and I think it will continue. There, we, we can't let Israel get away with this. It will destroy these organizations, the very organizations that are not only serving Palestinian civil society, but holding Israel accountable, documenting Israel's human rights abuses. And a, a couple of these organizations have been instrumental in providing uh, data and evidence to the International Criminal Court, which is now investigating Israel for war crimes. You know, uh, uh, thank you for that. Uh, as I look back uh, over my 20 plus years of activism, uh, standing with my Palestinian friends, uh, Huweda, and I don't want to romanticize uh, here, but the two characteristics that stand out for me about my friends in Palestine are hospitality and steadfastness. Talk, talk to us a little bit about what it means for you to be a Palestinian and a Palestinian woman. Wow, that is a very big question to answer, but you're exactly right. It is part of not only the Palestinian culture, but Arab culture in general to be uh, very hospitable. In fact, in Arab culture, you are, if, if there is a stranger that comes to you, you are obligated to take them in for three days, feed and house them before you're even allowed to ask their name. <laughs> uh, and that's an old uh, Bedouin Arab culture. Uh, and it remains. I, I can give you a story about that too that just brought home to me how, how deeply ingrained this uh, characteristic is. Back in 2002, I was living in Palestine in the occupied Palestinian territory in Ramallah and Israel had reinvaded almost every Palestinian city except for Jericho which they had encircled with uh, with a big trench, but their tanks and, um, and armored personnel carriers were in every Palestinian city, and these cities were under curfew. 
so people were not allowed to come out of their homes or risk being shot. For days at a time, meaning they were running out of medicine, food, things like that, until, um, in, until what, what time Israel would lift the curfew. I was a, you know, volunteering with an organization that I had helped co-found the International Solidarity Movement, and we were trying to assist people that needed urgent care but were, were stuck in their homes and not able to go to hospital or, or needed medication. A, an Israeli group contacted me at the time and they said, we want to get into Ramallah. We want to express solidarity. I said, this is not really the time for it. It, it was really an emergency and very uh, a time of extreme pressure on us and a lot of danger. And I said, I, I don't know, even know if we can get you into Ramallah. I mean, it was the Israeli military was all over surrounding it. But they, they persisted, you know, they really wanted to. And so we figured out a way to, you know, sneak them in. Uh, around the tanks and uh, and the soldiers and when we were walking in the streets now Palestinians are in their homes they can't get out we were walking in the streets really uh, taking advantage of if you will for right or for wrong the fact that th these people were Israelis or internationals when I was moving around with internationals not Palestinian and therefore Israel uh, wouldn't treat them the same as it would treat Palestinians. Palestinians would be and were shot if seen outside. As we're walking in the streets, Palestinians are at their window or at their doors and waving, knowing they're Israelis and saying like, Shalom, hello, and inviting them in for tea, for talk. This is at a time where their whole city is under curfew. They are uh, in very dire situation. Uh, everything is closed. The military of these people that are, you know, in the streets right now is the one that is the body that's doing this to them. And they're still welcoming these civilians inside because they knew that these civilians were coming uh, not as occupiers, not as invaders, not as colonizers, but were coming in solidarity with them. And so even at this most distressful time, uh, Palestinians that were trapped in their homes in this situation were welcoming them with open arms. And so that, that really opened my eyes to just how much work we have to do to show the rest of the world that Palestinians aren't, as Israel has labeled us for, and got away with labeling us for years and decades, as, as terrorists, as inherently violent, uh, to justify uh, you know, Israel's military actions and it, its settler colonial regime that it has imposed upon us. Um, we have that much work to do, and I think I, I, I'm grateful for the work that has been done, not just by Palestinians in the diaspora, but with all these organizations and groups, minority groups, solidarity groups, other, um, you know, other groups that uh, are, are persecuted where they are just a, an intersectional joining of forces recognizing that these forces that uh, oppress Palestinians or oppress uh, blacks or uh, the immigrants are all inherently um, uh, of the same, uh, no, how do you say it? They, it, it's, mm, we are joined as, I don't wanna be cliche as, but we're really not free until everyone is free. And those that are oppressing us are the same kind of forces that we have to work against together. And when we work together, not only on our own issue, but on, on the issues of other communities that are marginalized, we become stronger, our voices become stronger. And I think that, the work that has been done for years uh, on the ground by these groups without without tiring and groups i would say also like yours i know the i've heard of the great work that you've been doing in you know in fort wayne in indiana and in small communities all over the world we are now seeing the fruits of that with like all these organizations that have spoken out against what israel is doing uh, you know uh, uh, one of the things that my generation is being taught by a younger generation of activists, you just talked about it. And that is this intersectional, it, it, this intersectional struggle for full political, civil, and human rights. It's one struggle with one goal, and that is human dignity, the sustainability of the planet, freedom for uh, uh, freedom for uh, every single 
a human being. And uh, so the, the intersectional nature, I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned it, because the intersectional nature of the struggle is, uh, is something that we've been learning. We've been learning more and more now from uh, activists like yourself. You know, that it, that's, it's so true. I have taken delegations to, to Palestine, and one of the first delegations I took from the United States was a people of color delegation. And it is uh, eye-opening to see how, to see and to hear how people of color that have been long oppressed in the United States have just understood uh, understood right away what Palestinians were going through without a deep explanation. It, it rung true to them because they could relate it to something they've experienced. Might not be exactly the same, but it is the uh, similar kind of oppression and, and degradation and humiliation and, and all of these acts and forces that keep that keep communities down because communities are uh, because they're different, uh, black, brown, etc. And know. yeah, and so the, the fact that we are these struggles have um, joined forces is is a very powerful thing. It's a necessary thing. So you know, a number of years ago, we hosted here uh, the screening of Martin Luther King in Palestine, and uh, Clay Carson, who was responsible for the creation of it, who's at Stanford, he's the head of the Martin Luther King Jr. archives there, um, and he took a group of African American kids and did that play yeah. in Palestine. And so it was a very powerful, very powerful uh, experience for him to be here with us, and we really appreciated it. You know a story about that really quickly? I went to see that uh, because I, well, it, it meant a lot to me, but also I happened to be in it a little bit at the end. And I took my kids at the time. I think my daughter was about three or four years old. Uh, and when they saw at the end, I was being arrested. Uh, I, I, with uh, some other Palestinians, were trying to ride segregated Israeli buses. The Freedom Riders. Uh, the Freedom Riders, yeah. yes. And, and for that action, we were arrested. So back in the car, they were asking me why I was being arrested. And I tried to explain to them that in Palestine, there is a similar kind of racism. I had been teaching them about Martin Luther King and, and racism in the United States and was reading them children's book about it. And I said, it's the same kind of, of racism that keeps people down. And I, uh, I said, remember that book about Rosa Parks, how she was arrested because she, she insisted on sitting at the, the front of the bus? And then they asked, they're like, well, in the movie, Mama, were you black or were you white? And so uh -huh. I, I, just seeing it through a kid's eye, but, but that even though kind of that they were making the connection um, was really powerful for me. And I, I like to always find that balance of where do I, how much do I expose a child to, to make sure that they are aware of what's going on around them and hopefully will grow up to be very responsible and active citizens, but also not to traumatize them and, and take away the innocence of their youth. So that's been a challenge. You just mentioned your daughter, Mayar. Um, I want you to talk a little bit about, uh, I, I want to take you back to March and April of 2013. Uh -huh. um, uh, this is such a compelling story, Huweda, and uh, this is the birth of Dayar. Uh, uh, and I'd like for you to share it with us. You were about to give birth to your first, your first child, Dayar. Uh, you, you named him a son, and you and Adam had to make some difficult decisions. And uh, particularly, you had decided that you wanted to uh, give birth in Israel. Talk to us just about that period of time and why, why you made that decision. Yes, it was a very difficult time. Um, I, in, in 2002, Israel had deported my husband. Uh, well, we hadn't been married yet, but uh, just, right, no, actually, sorry, we were married. We were married only a couple of months, and they deported mm -hmm. him for the human rights work that we were doing in Palestine. At one demonstration, uh, we were joining with, with members of a village, uh, villagers to break the curfew that Israel had imposed on the village and march to the nearby city of Nablus, which was under, which Israel was carrying out a military operation. And Adam was behind a camera just filming everything that was doing and they arrested him. 
and a few days later he was deported, meaning he was not able to come back. We decided that I would stay in Palestine and continue the work that I was doing. And so for the first few years of our marriage, we were living in different, uh, in different countries. Then in, uh, it, it wasn't until 2012, 2013, we, we decided to start a family. And when it came time to give birth, the, the location was more of a, an issue than probably most people think about or have to think about. We were, because he was, um, well, let me go back. I am an Israeli citizen. My father gave his citizenship to me, even though I was born in the United States. Now, under Israeli law, you, if you're a citizen, you can pass your citizenship down for one generation uh, if you're born outside, if that child is born outside of Israel. So I got the citizenship, but now if I wanted to pass my citizenship to my child, the child would have to be born in Israel. And why do I want that child to have Israeli citizenship anyway? Uh, because that was the only guarantee I had now, and I don't know how long in the future that I would be able to have that child go back to Palestine and meet my family and know where they, uh, he came from because Israel denies millions of Palestinians the right to come home. Uh, not only refugees, but even Palestinians that just want to visit on a visa, it's up to Israel whether they let you in or not. And for many, uh, they don't let them in. And so I realized that if I don't give my child my citizenship, Israel in the future can just deny him entry. Uh, but knowing that Adam would not be able to get in, it was a difficult decision, and it was really Adam in the end that says, you know, him having those papers, that citizenship is much more important than me being there, which was, I think, a big sacrifice for him because this was our first child, and he knew that he wasn't going to be able to be there. We tried, though. We went together. I was nine <laughs> months pregnant, and we got on that plane. He came with me, but um, he was arrested at the airport and, and thrown in jail. We tried to appeal it to a judge. The judge wouldn't even listen. To us, we said we'll put down a bond. He just wants to be with me till we give birth, and the Israeli judge wouldn't have it. Uh, deported him, and so he couldn't be there at the birth of our son, and and a year and a half later, the birth of our daughter, which we also decided to have um, in Israel. <laughs> Actually, in Jerusalem, which Jerusalem is not officially a part of right. Israel, but Israel thinks it's a part of it, and <laughs> we decided to have the child in Jerusalem. So on on the pa American passport, it would say. Uh, born in Jerusalem, but it would serve the purpose of, of having the, the child, my son and daughter, also have an Israeli passport. So when they go back, they go back as citizens and Israel can't deny them entry. Hopefully the system will not, that's what my mom was trying to tell me. She was saying, just stay here in the United States and have the child here so we can be with you. Uh, who knows, maybe in the future, the system will change and Israel won't, you know, be this colonial and racist state. And I said, hopefully, but for now I can't, I can't take sure. that chance. So. I want to shift gears a little bit. In the past, I've always thought of the U.S. Congress as occupied territory. Um, and so I really didn't spend much time thinking about the U.S. Congress as any kind of allies at all. But uh, as you know, in the last few years, I'll just mention some names. I'm sure I'm going to miss some, but Jamal Bowman, Cori Bush, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ilhan Omar, and others, including the indomitable Betty McCollum, and uh, your friend, Rashida Tlaib. I've got a few questions about Congress. Uh, talk to us about the importance of your friend, Rashida Tlaib, as a member of the U.S. Congress. Well, it was, election was uh, historic, the first Palestinian uh, Muslim woman serving in the U.S. Congress. It really uplifted uh, Palestinians all over the world to see, knowing that, like you said, the Congress is very unfriendly uh, in, in the United States government as a whole for decades, very unfriendly to Palestinians, and, and really are the ones, unfortunately, underwriting and allowing Israel to do what it's doing because the United States provides Israel with not only you know, financial and military support, but also political cover at, at the UN, it prevents with with their uh, influence, other countries from taking measures uh, against Israel to try to enforce human rights uh, law or hold Israel accountable in any way. So it's, it's really the United States that is the, um, the enabler of what Israel is doing. And so to have then a, uh, a member of Congress that is Palestinian and a woman 
was just really uplifting to Palestinians and, uh, and to Palestinian youth, to Palestinian young women, seeing that someone that uh, looks like them can make it that far. And we have a lot of people now, young people thinking about running for Congress, which is, which is really wonderful and empowering. And uh, we've seen our community here in the United States also get more involved in, in politics. For so many years, uh, we have dedicated our energies, our funds to addressing the humanitarian needs of Palestinians, of, of refugees, of destroyed hospitals, destroyed homes, uh, every humanitarian catastrophe that Israel has created, Palestinians around the world have tried to, you know, come to the aid of uh, sponsoring refugees, rebuilding homes, rebuilding hospitals, helping their families stay steadfast when Israel is trying to really get rid of Palestinians, right? They want the entire land without the Palestinians in there. Right. And so policy after policy to push Palestinians out. And it is, I think, with the support of Palestinians all over the world that have helped the Palestinians that are there continue to stay there. But because we have really focused all our energies on this humanitarian work, uh, I believe that we have neglected the political work. Uh, and for a long time, I've been saying, just let us dedicate like five to 10% of the energy and the funds that we put into the humanitarian work into the political work so that we can address the root cause of the humanitarian crises that are coming one after the other, or else forever we'll be putting band-aids on, on the, um, the wounds that Israel creates. And over the past few years, that has been happening with Palestinian PACs uh, forming, uh, Palestinians get really rallying behind certain members of Congress, helping these members of Congress not only get elected, but also fundraise to be able to continue the work that they're doing. Also, so the, these members of Congress know that they have people behind them, because a lot of times what we hear is that the pro-Israel lobby is at our door. The pro-Israel lobby can and mobilize funds and votes, and therefore we have to do what they say. In fact, a retiring member of Congress, his name is slipping me right now. There was an article the other day where he said, APAC, the, uh, what, the Israeli lobby, they used to say jump and members of Congress would say how high. That's right. That's how it is. So it, it was really significant, and it is, that she is a voice, not only for Palestinians in Congress, but for the marginalized in her own community and across the United States and the world. Uh, and so we're, very, we're pr very proud of her and we need to get work to get more people like her and like the uh, kind of brave principled names that you mentioned there. Well, that begs the question, have you thought about running for Congress? You know, actually I have. <laughs> I, I am now living in the United States. I was living in Palestine for many years and doing the kind of human rights work that I was doing um, because my husband is not allowed into Palestine and not wanting to tear apart the family. We resettled in Michigan where I was uh, born and raised. And I, I see many of the, I don't wanna say the same, but in, injustices against my neighbors, against American citizens. It's not exactly the same as what Israel is doing to Palestinians, but it's still, a deprivation of rights. I mean, when when a single mother is working two jobs and still can't afford a home for her child, when somebody has to decide between putting food on the table and buying their medication, I mean, this is injustice. When, when jobs are being taken away from people or people can't have a dignified jobs so they can raise their own families, these are some of the core uh, needs of people everywhere, no matter where you are. Uh, and so how we fight for that, yes, I'm an activist where I am and here in the United States, fighting for uh, better health care for all, fighting for housing rights, fighting for voting rights. And uh, unfortunately, I live in a place that is represented right now by a, a person that is voting against really the interests of all, um, of, of all her constituents. Uh, and so, you know, my local Democratic Party has, has asked if uh, who's going to think about running uh, to challenge her. And so I've seriously been thinking about it and I formed an exploratory committee and we'll see. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, I know you're very active in uh, local Macomb County uh, politics uh, uh, outside Detroit. Um, and you were recently a keynoter for a celebration of labor. Uh, for the North Macomb Democratic Club, and, and you shared 
in this talk uh, why the United Auto Workers um, Union was so important to you. Can, can you share with us why a commitment to union organizing and workers' rights are so important to you? Uh, yes, I... Um, you know, what? my parents came here, my mother was uh, eight or nine, almost nine months pregnant with me, and I'm the oldest of five children. And they left Palestine wanting to settle in a place where they, you know, their new family uh, and their children would have the freedoms that was denied to them in Palestine and where their children could grow up with dreams of becoming, with the chance to succeed and not living under the boot of the Israeli military or a government that discriminates against you. And we were able to find that my, my father, his first job in the United States was with General Motors and was part of the union. And the union, you know, with the ups and downs of General Motors being laid off, and he always had the union backing him. I remember back in the 80s was laid off for quite a while, and we were able to survive by the, you know, the salary that the union was able to negotiate for all the workers that were uh, laid off, and then eventually getting his job back. And so until this day, even though my dad is now retired, proudly wears his union paraphernalia, his cap or his hat, wherever, wherever he goes. And that is, you know, that's the union that enabled him to raise his family here. We were the five children that he was able to uh, not only raise, we were not, you know, wealthy by any means, uh, working class uh, family. We didn't have much, but we weren't in, in want of anything and we all were able to go to college. And, and now have our own families and, and fairly successful. And that is in part due to the union and the, the job that they guaranteed him. And so many workers uh, these days and for the last few decades have been abused by this, the, these forces that have been working against union organizing, these companies that have mobilized to, to break up unions, to make it to disempower unions and when you disempower unions and and this collective bargaining you disempower the worker you leave the worker to fend for him or herself up against these corporations big corporations that they work for and in that kind of uh, in that kind of situation the worker is always going to lose and so you, the right to organize is is very important let me ask you um, we, we can't talk uh, to you without talking about the international solidarity movement right um, um, if I'm if I'm correct, this is the 20th anniversary uh, yes. of the uh, of ISM. Um, so talk to you, talk to us about what led you and Adam and the others to begin the International Solidarity Movement. Yes, we were. I had recently went gone over to to Palestine to work for a conflict resolution organization. A, it didn't take me long to see the massive uh, violations of people's dignity and human rights be before my eyes. And a few months after I arrived in Jerusalem, the Palestinian, the Intifada, or what we call the Second Intifada, broke out. That was uh, in the the September of 2000, the year 2000. And I was part of the the initial demonstrations, people marching in the streets, protesting. Uh, and also witnessed how Israel was responding to these protests. I mean, they were unarmed protests, largely men, women, children, elderly, people of all walks of, of Palestinian society marching against just decades of oppression. And the fact that we were supposed to be in a peace process since 1993, it was said that, you know, we have a peace process, the Oslo yeah. Peace Accords, but during that time, Israel just used this facade of a peace process to entrench its occupation and to continue to take more land. And at some point, Palestinians said, enough. Uh, we don't want to be part of this facade, uh, and we want our freedom. The Israeli military responded to these popular protests with the force of their military might, shooting at people. And within the first month of the Intifada, 127 Palestinians were shot dead. And the Israeli, very courageous Israeli journalist, Amir Haas, 
wrote about it in, in the early days of the Intifada, that Israel had a shoot to kill policy. 80% of the fatalities were from bullet wounds to the chest and head area. So it wasn't that Israel was using its forces to quell, even if they want to call it a riot and not a demonstration. This wasn't the way uh, that you quell a, a, a riot. This was a shoot to kill policy. And so it wasn't long before these popular protests died down. And it wasn't because Palestinians were suddenly afraid to risk their lives uh, for their freedom. But the calculation was Israel wants to get rid of us. The whole world, nobody is seeing what we are, what we are saying. Uh, the media is not only um, not covering our voices, but also blaming us for our own death. Because what they were saying there is, why did Palestinians walk away from the peace negotiations table? Um, and so looking for a way, being, I was young at the time, some say naive in Palestine, and wanting to reinvigorate the popular protest because once the popular protest died down, those with guns in Palestinian society, um, the armed factions, started using them, shooting at, uh, at Israeli military checkpoints, which only gave Israel more cover to come at Palestinian cities and towns, bombing them from the air, rolling their tanks in, uh, firing really cannons from their tanks at Palestinian homes and streets, uh, only increasing the death toll. It was horrific. But how do you what, what do you do? I, am, I can't uh, pick up a gun or join this kind of ar arm resistance. Uh, the, then the idea came about of trying to, trying to globalize the Intifada. Let's get people from around the world. I mean, the media is not covering what Palestinians are, are, are saying, what they're crying for. Let's try to get people from all over the world to come, to come here, to see what's happening with their own eyes and to stand with Palestinian civil society as they are protesting, as they are marching. Maybe if we do that, Israel will not use lethal force against us because Israel knows that it will be held to count if it kills international or if it wounds an international uh, because they're not held to count when they kill Palestinians. And, and the, also the people coming can go back to their home countries and tell people what's happening. Uh, and that was, that was the initial kind of naive, hopeful idea. We had dreams of thousands coming and forming this like civilian army that is going to block the Israeli military from rolling their tanks into Palestinian villages. And we did, we called for a campaign over uh, email for uh, August of 2001. And we didn't get thousands like we had uh, wanted. We didn't even get 200, but we got about 50 people, mainly from the United States and, and Europe. And those 50 people came, they saw, they worked with Palestinians and they went back to tell about what they saw. And soon we were getting emails saying, well, when's your next campaign? Because I have a friend that wants to come. And that's how we kind of flew by the seat of our pants. We're like, okay, we'll organize another <laughs> campaign. And now, 20 years later, we've had thousands, thousands. We stopped keeping record. We used to keep record of the, everybody that came, but Israel invaded our offices and, and took our computers so many times, we thought it best not to keep any records sure. anymore. We've had well over 10,000 people from about 35, 40 different countries come. And I think that it is the power of seeing what's happening and going back to your home country. Once you see what's happening on the ground in Palestine, it's not something you can easily forget. Uh, and the, the mobilization that we're seeing, the global boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement is largely really being led by these people that came uh, with the international solidarity movement and now are mobilizing to change the policies of their governments that are enabling Israel to do this. So it's, it's a, um, it was a, uh, probably a, a naive action by, by young idealistic, idealistic people, but it has really blossomed into a movement that is led by the activists and the Palestinians on the ground. I have been in the United States for uh, many years and the ISM continues to, to work and just powered by, by the volunteers that come through. You, I'm sure you get asked this a lot. You can't talk about ISM without talking about Tom Herndahl and Rachel Corey. Uh, and, and, they stand up, obviously, sadly, tragically, because they were killed. Many, many others have been injured, and many, many, many others have been threatened and, and all the rest. Uh, do you want to say a word about uh, not just those two, but, but uh, what, the uh, steadfastness, the courage, the commitment, the, the, the inner strength that, that it takes to stand in solidarity with oftentimes strangers, but really uh, 
for a larger transcendent cause. Yes, that, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, we are just so much respect for every uh, every person that has come through. You know, I, I'm Palestinian, so I have, you know, I'm kind yes, of invested. In yeah, I have skin yeah. in the game. But, <coughs> But people that, have, that let, leave the, the comforts of their own home, leave, put their work or their school or whatnot on hold to go to what is essentially kind of a, a, a consistent war zone that is dangerous to, to stand up for people's rights it, it is something that is um, really admirable, not only admirable, but it, it represents, I think, the, really the, the, best of, the best of human society. Uh, Rachel was, in 2003, tragically killed in Gaza while she was trying to block an Israeli armored bulldozer from, from destroying the home of a family that she had been staying with, a family that had taken her in, uh, and suddenly a bulldozer shows up and, and is ready to bulldoze their home. So she was trying to get this bulldozer driver to stop, and he played cat and mouse with her for about two hours, and at the one point, he just decided to keep going, and he ran her right over, crushed her to death. Um, and that was in uh, March 16, 2003. Before that, Israel had been trying to break the international solidarity movement and the phenomenon of internationals coming. At first, they tried to delegitimize us, trying to say that we were tools of the Palestinian Authority and we were uh, a cover for terrorists or we were crazies, and just trying to delegitimize our message. And that didn't work. Then they started firing, but not directly at us, kind of at walls. Some volunteers were hit with shrapnel, so injured. Now it becomes even more dangerous for internationals to, to do what we were doing. Uh, and so we had people injured that way. And then in 2003 was the first time they went that far to kill uh, an international. And to almost hit at this notion, this uh, unfortunately racist policy that Israel has in valuing international lives more than Palestinian lives. I mean, we knew that. That's why we knew that internationals being in, a, in with Palestinians would help protect people. But now it was, can internationals provide any protection anymore? Especially not only because they, they ran over and killed her, but because there was no accountability right. whatsoever. I Absolutely. mean, her parents pursued for years um, We've had Craig and Cindy here in Fort Wayne. At, Oh, yes, in Israeli courts and Israeli courts at the end, and not for any kind of, for anything more than just knowing the truth of what happened to their yeah. daughter and why. And literally, the military that testified in those, uh, those hearings that I sat through a few of them said, well, there are no civilians in war zones or in wartime, which yeah. is absurd. <laughs> That's the whole basis of international humanitarian law. But of course, Israeli courts rubber stamp Israeli military policy and Israeli government policy, and of course that's what is in, enabled the Israel to do what it's doing, aside from obviously international legitimization. But Tom Herndall, a, a few weeks after, was in Gaza. A sniper shot him, you know, in the head. He lay in coma for nine months before he died. A young photography student from the UK, and his mother also uh, has become very active. In, in, also, in continuing her son's legacy and campaigning for Palestinian justice as Cindy, uh, Cindy and Craig Corey. But this is, um, although it was a big, um, it, it was a big blow to us and to the internationals uh, about what, what effect we can have now and how much danger uh, our people, our volunteers in, the amazing thing is the, it didn't, it didn't kill the movement. It didn't stop people from coming. People continued to come then, and people continue to come now. And the Corys and the Herndals have also, you know, carried on the the legacy and the message of their children, which is also very heartening. Um, so it, it it is really, like I said, a, a, a people powered movement because once you see what's happening, you can't turn away, and that is. That is the power of it. I, I, words are not going to do it any kind of justice. But it's also, you know, when we, uh, a few years later, we took a flotilla to Gaza to challenge Israel's blockade. That was my next question. <laughs> Talk to us about Gaza. I just have a couple more questions, but one of them is about Gaza. So please continue. 
that uh, we started that in 2006, 2007, when Israel had really sealed off the Gaza Strip. Uh, and Gaza was always uh, under, surrounded by the Israeli military. But when it sealed, when it sealed Gaza, and it's because it's a small, small strip of land, it's 125 square kilometers. It is, um, no, sorry, it was 140. It, it, with 2 million people in okay. there and everything that goes in and out of Gaza is controlled by Israel. And when they sealed it off, they also severely limited what gets in and out. So they destroyed the economy. They, uh, people, the rates of unemployment was rising, malnutrition was rising. Uh, and on top of that, uh, you know, since since they closed it, there have been massive military campaigns. So this small piece of land then bombarded by with all of Israel's might. So you can imagine the destruction inside. But back in 2006, we were getting reports from the United Nations that uh, of, of the humanitarian catastrophe inside that uh, the threat of uh, an outbreak of waterborne diseases. They're seeing a, a, ra uh, a rise in, in instances of of malnutrition and stunted growth in children. And all the only thing you were seeing is reports, reports that nobody was acting on because nobody was holding Israel accountable. So ISM volunteers decided to challenge that. And the idea came to try to challenge it by sea, to take a boat and to sail to Gaza, which seemed like a really crazy idea because uh, we didn't have a boat and we didn't know anything about boats and we were gonna go challenge uh, the Israeli Navy. You know, Israel, Israel has one of the most powerful <laughs> militaries in the world. But, you know, we did it in the summer of 2008. We had managed to cobble together some funds and go into debt to get two dilapidated fishing boats and convert them to make them seaworthy to go across the Mediterranean from Cyprus to Gaza. And we really didn't think we would get into Gaza, honestly. And that wasn't the point. The point was to try to direct the world's attention to what Israel was doing. And so if Israel was going to confront us in the middle of the sea, we were 44 uh, people, peace activists from 17 different nations, not carrying any weapons, not a threat to anybody. So if Israel didn't let us get in and they confronted us at sea, we hoped to highlight to the world with the media that we had hoped to garner that Israel's policy towards Gaza has nothing to do with security. It has to do with trying to bring a whole society to its knees. To its knees. It, it, it is poli political persecution, which is illegal. But again, somebody hold Israel accountable. But we were going to challenge this policy. Never thought we would get in at all. But at the last minute, uh, Israel tried threatening us in the, in the lead up to about that we were going to get arrested, we were never going to get in. At the last minute, Israel backed down and we made it into the port of Gaza. The first boats to dock in the Gaza port in 42 years without Israel's permission. Not only did we get in, but when we got out, we were able to take out with us people that were trapped in Gaza. A young mm. boy who had been, um, he had lost his leg in an is Israeli military operation when a cannon uh, a missile was shot in his neighborhood. He was hit with shrap shrapnel, had to get his leg amputated. And Israel would not give him permission to leave to try to seek to, to get a prosthetic leg uh, in, in any other country. And so we took him. We put him with his wheelchair and his father on, on our boat. And we also put a mother and her children on our boat. She was from Sweden and had gone to visit family in Gaza. And two years later, Israel would still not let her out. So two years she was trapped with her children in Gaza, not able to return to to Sweden wow. and her and her children were on our boat and without asking for Israel's permission, we sailed out. And we kept those boats going until December of 2008 when uh, Israel was conducting Operation Cast Lead, yeah. one of the military operations and bombarding Gaza uh, from the air. And when we tried to take a boat full of medical supplies, Israel hit our boat, almost, um, almost sunk a very small boat that actually had a member of Congress on it and doctors and journalists. Uh, we tried to go again a few weeks later, and they also almost sunk that boat. So we decided, you know, we can stop these, these voyages by sea, or we can escalate. And so we decided to escalate, and instead of sending one small boat, to send a flotilla. And in May of 2010, we had managed to gather a, seven ships, different countries, um, different peace activists and organizers in different countries sponsored their own ships, cargo ships to carry 10,000 tons of aid that was needed in Gaza and 700 people from around the world on those ships. And on May 31st, 2010, in the middle of the night, Israel attacked 
launched a military mm -hmm. assault on those boats and killed 10 volunteers. Um, and, you know, I was relating this to the talking about Rachel and Tom because even though 10 volunteers were killed in that military operation and nobody held Israel accountable, except maybe Turkey for a while, which cut off relations with Israel. But the, the response from people all over the world was not fear, not we're gonna stop, but contacting us saying, we wanna go on your next mission. And so the summer after that, we had even more ships, even more activists in more countries from uh, around the world. And so- The movement, the movement is growing and the conversation is changing, I think. I think so. Uh, and you know, Israel is say, getting more desperate. Like we started off with designating these human rights organizations and these organizations that are uh, really important to documenting human rights abuses, to helping activists around the world also get information that we can use to, to, uh, to lobby and to educate, and so designating them as terrorist organizations. So there, um, it is growing. I think Israel is getting more desperate. It might get worse before it gets better, but we firmly believe that it's gonna get better. I mean, th this can't last. What Israel's been doing, we're talking over seven decades now, and, and we firmly believe that someday, hopefully it's sooner rather than later, Palestine will be free. Huweda, thank you very much for uh, your time this afternoon. It's wonderful to have you here in Fort Wayne. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm.